Hey everyone, welcome to the second episode of this EKG interpretation class. If you haven't already seen the first episode, don't forget to check that one out as well. I'm going to put the link down below in the description. In this episode, episode two, I'm going to talk about all sorts of details that you need to know when it comes to recording an EKG. And we're going to get started right now. If you're new here to my channel, this is your first time watching one of my videos, welcome, thanks for watching. If you've been here before though, welcome back. Either way, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, click that little bell notification button so that you don't miss out on anything and you'll get a little notification the next time my videos are ready for you. I also appreciate it if you hit that little like button, it really helps me out. All right, we're gonna jump right in, episode two, here we go. So because the heart is a three-dimensional structure, it's not some 2D structure, it's not just enough to record a single lead. Now it is possible we can record EKG tracings and just get one lead and we can see all sorts of information about the electrical conduction in the heart. But if we really want to be able to diagnose several different cardiac conditions, it's really important that we have more than one lead. We have to look at the heart as a true three-dimensional structure. The electrical activity of the heart needs to be understood in that way, in a three-dimensional structure, because electrical impulses are moving all sorts of different directions simultaneously. Like we talked about briefly in episode one, when the atrial depolarization is occurring, that wave of depolarization is spreading over the surface of the atria, and once that ventricular depolarization occurs, there's impulses moving in all sorts of different directions, and what we're seeing on an EKG tracing is the average of all of those impulses. We're going to talk a little bit about more of that, more of that today in this episode when we talk about vectors. The standard EKG consists of 12 leads, and each lead is determined by the placement and orientation of electrodes that we place on the patient's body. So here's an example of a 12 lead. Uh, notice the leads are named leads 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Okay, those are our 12 leads. And we can actually break these apart into two different categories. We can break them into limb leads and precordial leads. The limb leads, a, uh, one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, are recording from electrodes that are placed on the limbs. And then the precordial leads are sometimes called the chest leads. And these are from six different electrodes that are placed in specific locations on the patient's chest. We can gain a lot of information from looking at both limb leads and precordial leads together in this big 12-step process that I'll be outlining during uh, these next several episodes. Now, even though a 12-lead EKG prints with 12 different leads, it's important to know that the machine does this using only 10 different electrodes that are placed in specific locations on the patient's body. Now, for the six limb leads, that we see on our EKG tracing, the machine actually collects this information using four different electrodes that we place on the patient's arms and legs. One on each arm, one on each leg. And I'll show you where those should be placed properly in a few minutes. Using those four electrodes, the machine then calculates all the information it needs to produce the six leads that we see on the EKG tracing. And I'm gonna show you how it makes six leads out of four electrodes here in a minute. Then the precordial leads, or the chest leads, V1 through V6, are produced using six chest electrodes, electrodes that we place on the patient's chest in very specific locations. I'm gonna demonstrate that on a skeleton here in a minute, as well as on a real patient. So first, for the next few minutes, let's talk about those six limb leads that we get from four limb electrodes. So it's pretty important to understand that the six limb leads view the heart in a vertical plane. So we call this vertical plane the frontal plane, or you know, sometimes we might use the word coronal plane. It's seeing the heart more from a, th a two-dimensional view. Okay? Uh, you can envision this as a large circle that can be superimposed over a patient like you're seeing here in this image, with zero degrees being straight to the patient's left, positive 90 degrees being straight down, negative 90 degrees being straight up, and 180 degrees being straight to the patient's right. Basically, the six limb leads view the electrical forces of the heart moving either up and down or left and right, and they see the electrical conduction of the heart in this two-dimensional coronal plane. 
Now the electrodes that are used by the machine to create these six limb leads need to be placed on the arms and the legs of the patient. I'll demonstrate this here in a few minutes, but I want to point out something really important. The leads, excuse me, the electrodes should be placed on the patient's forearms and lower legs proximal to the wrist, proximal to the ankle. These are important locations because if we improperly place the electrodes too high on the patient's body, sometimes like in the ICU, I would sometimes see these being placed on the shoulders and hips rather than actually out on the limbs. This is going to mess with the amplitude in certain leads, especially the amplitude of the R wave. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about this more in a few minutes, so don't worry, pause, pause that thought. We'll discuss it more in a few minutes, the importance of the placement, but please know, proper placement of limb electrodes is on the forearms, just proximal to the wrists, and the lower extremities proximal to the ankle. The machine then is programmed to use these four limb electrodes to produce the tracings of the six limb leads by variably designating the electrodes as either positive or negative. Each lead has its own specific view of the heart. That's true for our limb leads, that's true for the precordial leads. We can call this view of the heart its specific angle of orientation. The angle of orientation then is expressed in degrees, like one of our limb leads records from a zero degree position. And so while we're talking about these limb leads, please understand that we've got positive 90 is straight down, negative 90 straight up, 180 to the patient's right in this frontal plane circle. So building off of that idea then, let's talk about it using this image that you see on this slide. The machine is going to create lead one on the EKG tracings by turning the electrode on the patient's left arm to be positive and the electrode on the patient's right arm to be negative. And the EKG machine actually kind of envisions the patient's arms out like this, okay, so that we can better understand the angles of orientation. So for lead one, machine turns electrode on the patient's left arm positive, electrode on the patient's right arm negative, and so it records impulses coming towards that positive electrode as a positive deflection. So we say that the angle of orientation for lead one then is zero degrees. It's straight to the patient's left. That's the angle from which lead one is seeing the heart. Anything positive, anything that's coming straight at lead one, straight towards the zero degree mark in that frontal plane will be recorded as a strong positive deflection on the patient's EKG in lead one. Lead two, on the other hand, is created by making both of the legs positive and by making the right arm negative. And so if you see here on this diagram, if we draw an arrow then facing towards that positive deflection, uh, the positive charged electrode, we will see then that the angle of orientation for lead two is positive 60 degrees. So lead two is an important lead for us because we oftentimes will use it as we oftentimes use it as the lead for determining the patient's rhythm because that's the lead that oftentimes give us, gives us that classic nice P wave, QRS complex, nice positive T wave because it's recording from that patient's positive 60 degree angle. It's recording from the patient's left hip essentially. So lead to recording from a positive 60 degree orientation. That's its view of the heart. Lead three is created by making the legs positive again, but this time we're making the patient's left arm negative. And you can see that the angle of orientation then for lead three is from positive 120 degrees. So just the opposite of lead two, but both lead two and lead three are seeing the heart from that bottom level, from the inferior aspect of the heart. That's its angle of orientation, positive 120 degrees. Now leads AVL, AVR, and AVF are what we would call the augmented leads. Okay, they're, they're used by making a combination again of these limb electrodes. Now uh, for lead AVL, this one is made by making the left arm, L, AVL, left, uh, 
arm positive and all the others negative. So the right arm and both legs would be negative. So as you can see here, the angle of orientation, if we take the average between those two negatives and go straight towards the positive, is up into the patient's left a little bit. So that we say then that lead AVL is recording from the patient's negative 30 degree angle. That's its angle of orientation, negative 30 degrees. AVR is just the opposite, AVR right. So this is done by making the right arm positive and the left arm and legs negative. If we take the average between those again, the angle of orientation that we see with AVR is from the negative 150 degree angle. AVR is unique in that the large majority of what AVR sees from its angle of orientation is moving away from it because in a normal healthy heart, most of the electrical conduction is happening in a down to the left direction. So most of the deflections we see on an EKG tracing for AVR are in a downward deflection. Don't worry about that too much right now in great detail. We'll get into that in the future, but AVR is an important lead for being able to help us determine things like normal access in some situations. The last of the limb leads then, AVF, F for feet, okay? So in this case, we turn the feet positive, both arms are negative, and so in this case, the angle of orientation is recording from straight down. So AVF is recording from the angle of orientation of positive 90 degrees, recording straight from the patient's feet. This means then that any electrical impulse that is moving straight towards the patient's feet will be recorded as a strong positive deflection in AVF on the EKG. So here is the hexaxial reference system. So notice we've got our frontal plane circle again laid over this heart, this drawing of a heart, and it's labeled this time with the different leads and their degrees or their angles of orientation. And you'll notice that leads two, if you look in the cur at the cursor here, leads two, three and AVF are all recording from the bottom aspect of the heart. In other words, they are seeing the inferior wall of the heart. That's their angle of orientation. Leads one and AVL, on the other hand, are seeing the lateral wall of the heart. So we could also say that these are lateral leads. These three are inferior leads and these two are two of our four lateral leads. You'll see the other four here in a minute, they're precordial leads. AVR, on the other hand, is recording from an upper right position. We don't say that it's part of lateral leads or inferior leads or anterior leads or anything like that, but generally we want to remember that AVR is recording from this upper right position. So generally, in a normal healthy heart, it's going to see the electrical conduction happening down into the patient's left away from its angle of orientation, so most of the deflections that we're going to see on an EKG tracing in AVR are going to be downward deflections. And that can become important, especially when we're talking about access, like we'll talk about in one of our later episodes. All right, so those are our limb leads using those four limb electrodes making six limb leads. Um, let's shift now into the precordial leads. Now there are six precordial leads and they're a little more straightforward than the limb leads. The precordial leads are arranged in more of a horizontal plane. So remember when we were talking about the limb leads, it was more of a, a, a frontal or coronal plane that those leads envision the heart from. But the precordial leads record more of an horizontal plane. They look at the heart in this direction. And then between the two, between the limb leads and the precordial leads, we can then understand a more three-dimensional structure of the electrical conduction in the heart. So these six precordial leads are a little more simple and straightforward to understand compared to the limb leads. Um, and they record impulses that are moving straight at them. So while they're placed on the chest, anything, any impulse that's moving straight at those electrodes will be recorded um, as appropriate deflections on the EKG in that precordial lead. So let's talk about proper placement of these precordial chest leads on a patient's body. All right, so here's a drawing of a patient's chest and you can see the, the ribs and the sternum. Now the body of the sternum, labeled here, body of the sternum is the biggest part of the sternum, and then at the top, the top about 
two, two inches or so of the patient's sternum is actually called the manubrium. And there between the manubrium and the body of the sternum is a little ridge that's actually palpable. It's more easily palpable on some patients than others, but you should be able to feel it if you feel along the sternum about two inches from that sternal notch between the clavicles. And find that sternal angle, and then if you look off on the side of the sternal angle, there are two ribs that come in right at that level. That's, those are ribs two. So that's the quick, easy way to find rib two. So it's important to be able to identify those ribs then. So once you find that sternal angle, we found rib two. We can palpate down the patient's ribs and find three, four, five. Now, also important anatomy to understand is how we name and know which intercostal spaces are which. The intercostal spaces are the spaces between the ribs, and the intercostal space is named for the rib just above it. So in this case, the intercostal space below rib two is the second intercostal space, and so on. Below rib three, the third intercostal space. Below rib four, the fourth intercostal space. And we would say that this right here would be the fourth intercostal space along the sternal border. Okay, so that's an important anatomy to understand as we're moving forward talking about where we're going to place these leads. Alright, so this drawing then shows the placement of the precordial leads according to their intercostal space. So as you can see, V1 and V2 are right up against the sternal border, and we place those in the right and the left intercostal space at the fourth intercostal space along the sternal border. So V1 on the right sternal border, fourth intercostal space, V2 on the left. Now V4 goes at the midclavicular line in the next intercostal space down, fifth intercostal space. V3 goes between those, and V5 and V6 stay in that same horizontal plane as V4, but follow it out onto the anterior axillary line, mid axillary line. So I'm gonna show you that on an actual skeleton in the lab here in just a minute. For this drawing, I've placed the heart behind the ribs so you can kind of get an idea of where these leads then, or these electrodes, lie in respect to the patient's heart. You can see that V1 and V2 see more of the, the top portion of the heart, and we're actually going to talk about V1 and V2 looking at more of a septal view, but notice V1 is going to have a similar angle of orientation to AVR, one of our limb leads. V2, V3, and V4 then are kind of nicely draped over the anterior aspect of the heart, and V5 and V6, when placed appropriately, actually have a pretty good visualization of the lateral wall of the heart. So similarly, remember when we were talking about the hexaxial reference system, 2, 3, and AVF have an inferior view of the heart. We say V1 through V4 view the anterior wall of the heart, with V1 and V2 having what is said to be a septal view of the heart, and then V5 and V6, because they're way over the side of the patient's chest wall, actually have more of a lateral view of the heart. So we're gonna lump those together with our other two uh, limb leads, AVL and lead one, to make up our lateral leads. I'm gonna put that all together towards the end, so don't get too, too flustered right now if that's getting a little uh, beyond where you're at. Here's a CT scan that is showing a, a similar idea of what I was just trying to explain. So looking here at the patient's CT, here's the patient's heart. Okay, V1 and V2 looking kind of straight down on the patient's heart, but from a, a more superior view up at the top level of the heart. V3 and V4 again looking over that anterior wall, but V5 at the anterior axillary line and V6 in the mid axillary line, notice that the angle of orientation for V5 and V6 is definitely along the lateral aspect of the heart. All right, let me take a minute and show that to you on a skeleton. So as you can see here, we've got the, the sternum the body of the sternum is this lower part with the xiphoid process sticking out at the bottom. And the top part, the top couple of inches, is called the manubrium. And here, as you can see, there's a small little angle or a ridge called the sternal angle. And the sternal angle uh, is what we're going to be filling for on our patient. So as we fill that sternal ridge, that sternal angle, we're going to go off to the side of that and notice that we're right on ribs two. So the, the first rib is up high under the clavicles. Uh, this is rib number two. The inner space just below it is the second intercostal space. Then we've got the third rib, third intercostal space, fourth rib, fourth intercostal space. So this is what we're palpating for on our patient to decide where we're going to place V1 and V2. So sternal angle, ribs two, 
fourth intercostal space, V1, V2. Then we're going to go down into fifth intercostal space out to the mid clavicular line, place V4, place V3 between the two, and stay in this fifth intercostal space or at least the same horizontal plane to go to V5 in the anterior axillary line, V6 in the mid axillary line under the patient's armpit. All right, with the risk of repeating myself a couple of times, uh, I want to just kind of put that all together one more time. See here uh, on, on the screen, we've got our hexaxial reference system with the leads labeled in their specific angles of orientation, and then we have our precordial leads with the same. And you can see that between the two of these, between our limb leads and our precordial leads, we can get a pretty good three-dimensional view of the heart electrically with the limb leads recording more of this frontal plane or coronal plane and our precordial leads recording more of a horizontal plane. And so as we understand this moving forward in this EKG course, uh, realize that if you, if you remember where the leads are recording from or their specific angle of orientation, you can really put this together and have a pretty good grasp of the patient's heart from a three-dimensional electrical structure. All right, so putting all that into practice here, this is the patient's EKG. Let's say you're in, in, in the clinic, you're handed this print off, here's the patient's EKG. You can quickly look at this, knowing what you know now, and quickly identify which are the limb leads, which are the precordial leads. Now, beyond that, however, you can also have an idea of which leads are telling you information about which aspects of the heart. And we call this idea the anatomically contiguous leads. All right, so let's put those together. Anatomically contiguous, meaning leads that are viewing the heart from the same three-dimensional aspect. We've got here leads two, three, and AVF, which we know are our inferior leads. They are recording the electrical conduction of the heart from the bottom aspect or the inferior aspect of the heart. Then we have our anterior leads, V1 through V4. These are recording the electrical conduction of the heart from an anterior view, from in front of the heart. And then we have V5, V6, AVL, and lead 1. Uh, these are our lateral leads. They're recording the lateral wall of the heart or the electrical conduction system as viewed from the left side of the patient. Um, with lead 1 and AVL, viewing the heart from more of an upper or a high lateral position, and V5 and V6 viewing the lateral wall, lateral wall of the heart from more of a lower lateral wall position. So we could put this all together, the anatomically contiguous leads as listed in that table, inferior leads 2, 3, AVF, lateral leads 1, AVL, V5 and V6, the anterior leads V1 through V4, and it's also said that V1 and V2 are recording from more of a septal type position. Okay, so we've talked about placing these electrodes in the right places and the angle of orientation from which these read. I've also shown you on a skeleton where you want to place those precordial leads, but now let me take a minute and I want to demonstrate this electrode placement on an actual real person. So when you're recording your EKG, you're going to be using these little electrodes. Okay, we don't call these leads, these are electrodes. So we place the electrodes on the patient's skin and uh, then your EKG lead is going to clip on. The type of uh, EKG machine that I have has a clip, that, a little alligator clip that clips right onto these little tabs. As you can see, there is a sticky part to this and a part that's not sticky and the alligator clip clips right on there. And so there are other kinds of electrodes that are button snap-on or some that, uh, different types of alligator clips. So let's go ahead and I'll show you where you would place this on an actual patient. All right, so if your patient is overly hairy, which our patient today is not, um, you might need to shave patches uh, once you identify the locations of where you're going to place your electrodes. Uh, but uh, like I had demonstrated on our skeleton, we want to find the fourth intercostal space. So as we're doing this on a patient, we want to first find their, their sternum, body of the sternum here, manubrium at the top, and we want to find that sternal ridge that exists between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. And once you feel that, 
off to the side, you're going to find ribs at that same level. And once you find that rib, that's the second rib, and this inner space just below it is the second intercostal space. And remember, we want V1 and V2 electrodes to be in the fourth intercostal space. So we're gonna slide down even further, find that third rib, third intercostal space, fourth rib, and then the fourth intercostal space right there. So right along the sternum, on the left and the right sternal border in the fourth intercostal space is where we want to place our V1 and V2 electrodes. I like to have the tab that our uh, lead is going to clip onto facing down because that tends to uh, make it easier to grab onto uh, when I have my, my wires coming in from below. So I'll have V1 and V2, fourth intercostal space along the right and the left intercostal border. Now for, I, I usually skip ahead now to V4, and so V4, we, we're, here's fourth intercostal space, I'm going to go down one rib space into the fifth intercostal space, I'm going to follow that out, fifth intercostal space here, into the mid-clavicular line. So V4 should be in the mid-clavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. That is going to be V4. It's a little lateral, so I'm going to move it here. Mid-clavicular line, fifth intercostal space, V4. And then V3 is easy because it's just right in the middle of V2 and V4. Don't have to worry about interspaces, just right between the two on that line. That's V3. And then for V5, we're going to continue to follow that fifth intercostal space out. It should be in the same horizontal uh, line as V4 and uh, to the anterior axillary line, right where the patient's body starts to drop off down towards the table. So we're going to place V5 there. That's our first of the lateral precordial leads, uh, electrodes. And then we're going to go with V6 is in that same intercostal space, same horizontal plane out here, but in the mid axillary line. Oftentimes I see these placed too high. We really want that down here in the mid axillary line right underneath the patient's armpit uh, because these two leads when we're looking at it on our 12 lead are going to give us that lateral view of the lateral wall of the heart. So make sure those are where they're supposed to be. Anterior axillary line, mid axillary line, V5, V6. So now we have our six precordial leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Okay. Now, notice we've got four electrodes left over. These are our limb leads. And so we want to place two limb leads on the upper extremities and two limb leads on the lower extremities. For the upper extremities, we want to make sure that we're actually on the extremities. Oftentimes in the ICU, I would see these being placed you know, more on the chest wall than anything, but we want these to be placed somewhere on the extremity. So oftentimes just down here on the bicep, or I oftentimes will go down onto the patient's forearm actually. Make sure it's somewhere on the limb, not on the chest wall. So we'll place those electrodes. Uh, right arm, left arm, and then we would do the same with the lower extremities. All right, so pausing my demonstration for just a minute, I want to talk about the importance of placing the electrodes on the arms and the legs in the right place. Now in the video, I put these electrodes on the bicep, okay? The best and most proper and most important place to place these to have a, the most accurate EKG tracing is going to be on the patient's forearm just proximal to the wrist, okay? And so unless it's impossible because of amputation or significant trauma on your patient or whatever it might be, place those that the limb electrode down on the patient's forearm proximal to the wrist, down on the lower leg proximal to the ankle, okay? You might wonder, well, well why? I mean, we, we record rhythm strips using telemetry using these electrodes on the chest wall, so why is it so important that they're that far down on the limbs, okay? Now, yes, it's true, you can record a single EKG lead using electrodes placed that high on the patient's arm or up clear up onto the chest wall. But the important thing to understand is if you're going to be taking your EKG interpretation, you're going to use this 12 lead EKG and interpret fully, full comprehensive interpretation, all 12 steps that I'm going to show you. It's really important then that you have those electrodes placed in the right spot because at some point you're going to be making decisions as you're interpreting this EKG whether or not the patient has something like left ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, and as you'll see as we go into future episodes, 
that decision process involves amplitude of the R waves in certain leads, including limb leads. And if the electrodes are placed too high on the arm or even onto the chest wall, huge no-no, okay, then the amplitude of the R waves is going to be not accurate. So the lower down on the patient's extremities, just proximal to the wrists and ankles, is proper placement if you're going to be doing that thorough of EKG interpretation. And I would challenge you to do that thorough of EKG interpretation every time you interpret an EKG. So with the lower extremities, again, we do want them to be on the limb um, because your patient's normally going to be wearing pants. You want to make sure that uh, you usually are going to do it down in the lower part of the extremities. I will oftentimes have the tab facing back up rather than down because my wires are going to be coming down to that area. So I place these down sometimes on the, the anterior shins, but make sure you don't place them on uh, abdomen and call it limb leads. Make sure it's truly on the patient's limbs. All right, so once you've got all your electrodes placed, you pull the, the leads up. As you can see, I've got, these are my precordial uh, wires and I've got my limb wires here that are going to be able to allow the machine to calculate our leads for our 12 leads. Um, on this machine, uh, it labels each one of them. This is V3 and each one of them will be labeled the, the respective number. And you just need to make sure you correct connect them to the correct electrode that you've placed. So I'm going to, I like to have the, the wires kind of resting here on the patient's body, uh, keeping them stable, and then you can reposition the wires as needed so that it's not pulling on the electrode. So I'm going to place, this one's V1, just clips right here onto the little tab. Here's V3. So I'm going to try to keep these organized rather than too tangled up. V2, Here's V4, and notice it's peeling off, so then that's when you want to uh, use your wires to your advantage to try to help hold things up on the chest, and sometimes you might even need to pull out a little bit of paper tape or something like that to help hold it in place, because you're not going to be able to hold it in place while it's running or it's going to pick up electrical activity from you. So you're going to do V5 and then clip on V6 as well. So sometimes it might require some tape to help hold everything in place. Maybe put a piece of tape here on the patient's skin uh, to help hold those, those uh, cables in place while it records the EKG. And you would do the exact same thing with your limb leads, right arm to right arm, left arm to left arm, and same with the lower extremities clipping onto those electrodes. Once you've got it all hooked up, you're gonna stand back from your patient have them just breathe normally and hold nice and still while you go ahead and hit record and it'll print off your 12 lead EKG or a rhythm strip depending on what you are trying to record. So another important thing to understand is that each EKG electrode only records the average current flow at any given time. Even though small swirls of current might be happening in all sorts of directions at a given moment, uh, that EKG electrode is only going to record the instantaneous average of all of those different electrical directions. We generally call this average the vector, okay? The vector. So the vector's angle of orientation represents the average direction of current flow through the tissue at that moment. And over any particular period of time, such as atrial depolarization, these individual vectors can all be summed up into what we could call the vector of vectors. And this basically describes the average direction or angle of current flow through the tissue, both the direction and the magnitude. All right, so let me demonstrate that idea of the vectors of current on this drawing. So if we've got the atrial depolarization starting here in the SA node, remember it spreads a lot like waves or ripples in a pond uh, when the SA node fires. It spreads over the surface of this three-dimensional structure, the atria. So with that, we have vectors that are moving in all sorts of different directions. We have vectors of current flow. Some are moving towards the patient's left, some are moving towards the right, some are moving anterior, some are even moving posterior. And so the average of all of these would be somewhere, as long as the heart is healthy, in the down and to the left position. And we would call this the vector of vectors, or the vector, the average vector for the atria. And so most of our inferior leads and our left lateral leads are going to record atrial depolarization as a positive deflection.
very similar thought or concept in the ventricles. It's just a little bit more complicated and rapid, right? Because we have the ventricular depolarization that happens very quickly. And we have vectors of current moving in all sorts of different directions all at the same time. Some seem to be moving more upwards, some seem to be moving to the right, some are to the left, because this three-dimensional structure. But because of the mass of the ventricle and because it's larger over here, down and on the left, the average vector, or the vector of vectors, is going to be down and to the patient's left. As long as the heart is normal size and there's no significant hypertrophy or disease, down and to the patient's left. All right, so let's talk about atrial depolarization and how the leads then see this. And we're going to talk about leads AVR 1, 3, and 2. Okay, so here's atrial depolarization starting the atria. It's going to spread, and like we talked about, this, the average or sum vector of all of this is going to be more of a down and to the left position. So then how is lead 2 going to see this event? It's going to see it as a positive deflection because from its angle of orientation, which is positive 60 degrees, it is seeing atrial depolarization happening straight towards it. Okay. Now, the opposite of that, AVR, which its angle of orientation being negative 150 degrees, is going to see this same event as moving directly away from it. So normally, a P wave in AVR is a downward deflection. Lead 3 recording from this positive 120 degree spot and lead 1 recording from a 0 degree location are going to see this atrial depolarization event somewhat as moving right past it. And so lead 2 at the beginning is, excuse me, lead 1 is going to see this as a positive deflection, but there might be a negative component to it because it is this wave of current is moving perpendicular to some degree and that's the same thought here in lead three and so oftentimes in lead one and lead three we see atrial depolarization or the p wave being more of a biphasic type appearance not always but it's pretty common Ventricular depolarization, again, the idea is pretty much the same. We've got a lot of movement in all sorts of different directions, but the grand movement, the vector of vectors in a normal healthy heart is down and to the left. So a similar idea again here in lead two, because of its angle of orientation, it's seeing everything from this positive 60 degree mark. It's going to see this ventricular depolarization as coming straight at it for the most part. So in lead Two, we oftentimes will see mostly a positive deflection. There might still be a small little Q wave and a small little S wave because of the complexity of the electrical depolarization waves through the ventricles and because of things like septal depolarization and whatnot. But the large majority of what lead two sees is coming straight at it. So lead two generally has a very positive looking QRS complex. And it's the exact opposite story up here in AVR. AVR generally sees everything in the ventricles moving away from it. And so AVR will record mostly a negative deflection for a QRS complex. And lead three and lead one, generally, again, same idea as we talked about with a P wave. Generally, we're going to see more of a biphasic type appearance to the QRS complex. Now there can obviously be large degrees of variation in this, but that comes with all the significant pathology. In a normal healthy heart, QRS complex and AVR is mostly a big, posit a big negative deflection, where in lead two, it's mostly a big positive deflection. In lead three and lead one are mostly more of a biphasic type appearance, simply because of this idea of vectors and how they help to create this tracing on the patient's EKG. All right, one more quick thought before we wrap this up. Um, at the end of my demonstration a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that you could record a rhythm strip or a 12 lead EKG. So what is a rhythm strip? So remember that a 12 lead EKG is recording impulses over a six second window of time from 12 different angles of orientation. So in several situations, we're going to want to record the patient's EKG for a lot longer than six seconds. Uh, some of those situations might be ACLS protocols where we're doing active resuscitation of a patient, uh, other times up in the hospital floor or in the ICU where we want to do what's called cardiac monitoring or telemetry 
Okay, so we call this whole concept of continuous EKG recording cardiac monitoring. This can be done with fewer electrodes than we use with a full 12 lead EKG, and we put them in different places on the patient's body. They're color coded, and we've got a nice little saying to help remember where we're going to place these. So like you're seeing here on the drawing, uh, the, there are white, green, red, and black electrodes. Um, most of the time they are color coded this way um, to help us remember because most of us clinicians learned it the same way. Uh, there's a saying here, white, right, grass grows under the clouds, smoke over fire. Okay, So if you look, the right electrode here, right upper is white in color it's placed on the patient's upper right chest just below the clavicle and we're going to say that's the clouds lower right on uh, so right leg rl or right lower uh, is going to be below the patient's rib cage on the right side and it's green in color so we say white right grass grows under the white clouds <laughs> Okay, and then we've got smoke over fire. We've got red as the fire, black as the smoke, and we've got this black electrode then under the patient's left clavicle on their upper left chest, and the red electrode, the left lower, or left leg electrode being on the patient's lower left below the rib cage, and so that's smoke over fire. White right, grass grows under the clouds, and smoke over fire. Sometimes we might use V1, it's used sometimes, but not always. Um, this would just give us a second lead. So if we're doing cardiac monitoring, this gives us multiple limb leads that could be used or looked at. This gives us one precordial lead, and it's just placed similarly, just, just the way we would normally place V1 along the right sternal border in that fourth intercostal space. All right, well, that brings us to the end of the second episode. I hope you found it helpful and clear. These first two episodes cover largely foundational material, and that's why they're longer than the future episodes are going to be. Most of the future episodes will be shorter than this one and episode one, um, and that's because episode one and two really include a lot of basic, important foundational principles that you really need to understand before we can get into the actual steps of interpreting a 12 lead EKG. So for episode three, we're going to be talking about how to determine regularity and rate on a rhythm strip, so make sure you check that one out. Don't forget to hit subscribe, hit that notification button so you get notified every time I post a new video. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please click that thumbs up button as that really helps me out. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.